Welcome uh, to the forum at Harvard School of Public Health. I am Dean Julio Frank, and I am delighted that, that the Honorable Eric Holder, Attorney General of the United States, could join us today. It is a great honor to have you with us, Mr. Attorney General. Today's session is part of an expanded effort at our school to bring senior policy leaders into our community in order to create a mutually enriching dialogue between researchers and decision makers. We believe that universities should strive to combine two fundamental values, excellence and relevance. Excellence in the pursuit of the highest standards of scientific quality and relevance to address the most pressing issues of our times. This is important because science is the most powerful force to enlighten purposeful social transformation. But the results of science need to reach decision makers and top leaders need to inform a research and education agenda. To inspire and organize these efforts, I have created a new division of policy translation and leadership development led by Bob Landon, who's here uh, in the audience today. This new state-of-the-art broadcast studio where we are today is part of this strategy, giving us a 21st century approach to amplify our reach. We have a studio audience here with us for the discussion with the Attorney General who are joined by what we know from experience will be thousands of people watching this live web webcast and later taking a look at our forum website where they will find video of today's discussion posted for on-demand viewing. We are especially pleased that the Attorney General of the United States is with us today to offer his views on the disturbing problem of violence affecting childhood and youth. Eric Holder has adopted an enlightened perspective that understands cycles of violence as a public health issue. He has seen that this problem demands a preventive approach, the way we in the public health field always approach threats to human well-being. Prevention, protection. With these words, he's showing us that he embraces the essential duty of government to protect people, whether it be from disease, destitution, or disaster. Here at the school, we have long been involved with today's topic. Our Youth Violence Prevention Center has worked collaboratively to build community capacity for youth violence prevention in Boston. The school also has an injury uh, uh, control research center, and both are directed by Professor David Hemingway, also here in the audience with us today. And also with us is Barbara Ferrer, who leads the Boston Public Health Commission, working with the commission and with the Boston Public Schools the Harvard Youth Violence Prevention Center released data in 2008 indicating that 69% of the youth surveyed reported witnessing violence in the previous year. So this is a topic that certainly concerns many in this room and in communities across the United States and in this, indeed across the world. And now let me introduce our esteemed guest. On December 1st, 2008, President Barack Obama announced his intention to nominate Eric H. Holder, Jr. as Attorney General. He was sworn in on February the 3rd, 2009. Raised in Elmhurst, Queens, Mr. Holder was educated at one of New York City's top public schools, Stuyvesant High School, from which he graduated with honors. He attended Columbia University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in American history and a law degree. While in law school, he clerked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Department of Justice's Criminal Division. Upon graduating, he moved to Washington, D.C. and joined the Department of Justice Public Integrity Section. Subsequently, he served as Associate Judge of the Supreme Cor Court of the District of Columbia, as U.S. Attorney for Washington, D.C., and as Deputy Attorney General. Mr. Holder has clearly and assiduously identified the importance of preventing children's and young people's exposure to violence and of mitigating its effects. As Attorney General, he announced in 2010 the launch of his initiative on defending childhood. In doing so, he elevated the national discussion around violence. As I mentioned, our distinguished guest recognizes the key role that public health can make in addressing cycles of violence and has committed funds toward solving the problem. We have invited Mr. Holder here to describe the initiative, its initial impact, and the way forward. After the Attorney General has made his remarks, Yay Winston, director of our Center for Health Communication, will join him in conversation 
and then take questions about the initiative from the audience, including questions from our online viewers. So please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And good afternoon to those who are watching online, I guess. I, and those of you online, please, have you have your seats. I'm sure I'm getting a standing ovation out there. <laughs> but thank you uh, so much, Dean. It is a, a great pleasure to be here. And it's a privilege to join with so many leaders and distinguished members of the Harvard community. I especially want to thank Associate Dean uh, Jay Winston uh, for moderating our discussion and more importantly for his leadership and for his, his friendship. Uh, more years ago than I would like to uh, say when I served as the Washington DC United States Attorney uh, during one of our, our city's most dangerous eras. At that point, Washington DC was called the murder capital of uh, the United States. Uh, Jay and I worked together on uh, several initiatives to reduce, uh, reduce youth violence and to promote uh, youth mentoring. Today, Jay and several other members of the Harvard faculty, including uh, Dr. Felton Fields, uh, Dr. Alvin Poussaint, who went to the same high school I did, same college that I did, and who I'm glad to see here, uh, are valued partners of the Department of Justice. And all of us will benefit from the perspective and the uh, expertise that they bring to today's discussion. Now, I look forward to hearing from uh, Jay and from all of you about the ways that uh, we must and that we will strengthen our uh, approach to addressing one of the greatest public safety uh, and public health epidemics of our time, and that is children's exposure to violence. Now, no matter your area of interest or your area of expertise, uh, this issue is at the forefront of the goals that we share. For me, protecting the health and the safety of America's children has been both a personal and professional concern for, for decades. As a prosecutor, as a judge, as the United States Attorney, and as Deputy Attorney General, addressing the causes and remedying the consequences of children's exposure to violence was a prominent part of my daily work. Today, as Attorney General and as a parent of three teenagers, it remains a top priority. Now, over the years, I've learned that we must confront these, this problem by clearly and thoroughly understanding what we and what our children are up against. Now, during the late 1990s, when I served as Deputy Attorney General in the Clinton administration, I had the opportunity to work with leading researchers to take an in-depth look at the problem of children's exposure to violence. And we learned that whether a child was an observer or a direct victim of violence, the experience was associated with long-term physical, psychological, and emotional harm, as well as a higher risk for drug and alcohol abuse later in life. And this is whether a person, a child, was a direct victim or an observer of violence. We discovered that children exposed to violence fail in school more often than other kids, are more likely to suffer depression, anxiety, and other post-traumatic disorders. They are more likely to develop chronic diseases and to have trouble forming emotional attachments. And they are more likely to commit acts of the violence themselves. In short, we learned that violence affects the brain as much as it affects the body and the spirit. But we still didn't know how prevalent the problem really was. Back then, we didn't have comprehensive data or the tools that could give us the full story about where, exactly where, uh, violence touches the lives of children across all age groups and across all settings. And we didn't have the research to tell us about the cumulative effect of exposure to violence. Well, now we do. And now more than ever, uh, we have to act. During my first year as Attorney General, the Justice Department released findings from our National Survey of Children's Exposure to Violence which reveal that the majority of our children, the majority of our children, more than 60% of them, have been exposed to some type of crime, abuse, or violence. Now, these patterns of violence can take really many forms, from pushing, hitting, bullying, to witnessing or experiencing gun, knife, gang, domestic, or sexual violence. And they aren't limited to any one region, any one community, or any one demographic group. Exposure can happen at home, it can happen in the streets, it can happen during school, it can happen on the internet where children face serious and unprecedented threats. I was startled to learn in my review of the most recent Boston Youth Survey produced by Harvard's own Youth Violence Prevention Center that in one month, in one month, more than seven in ten of the young men surveyed said that they had fired a gun or were punched, kicked, choked, beaten up, shot at, 
or attacked with a weapon. Seven out of ten. And more than a quarter of these young people said that they felt unsafe in MBTA buses, trains, and stations. But no matter where you live today, across this country, children are more likely to be exposed to violence and crime than adults. Uh, this problem has significant consequences for individuals, for families, and for entire communities, and affects each one of us. That's why effectively addressing it must, I believe, become our common cause. Now, many of you have already pledged your best efforts in this work, and I'm here today to tell you that I will not ignore the needs of our most precious and most vulnerable among us. A justice system and a society that fails to make protecting children a top priority is failing in its most fundamental responsibility. But the good news is that today there is, I think, good cause for optimism. Quality intervention programs have shown very clear benefits in fostering healthy child development and countering the negative effects of violence. In other words, it's possible, it is within our power to help the kids who need us the most. At the Department of Justice, we have made a historic commitment to this work. I'm proud that through our Defending Childhood Initiative, we are directing resources for the express purpose of reducing children's exposure to violence to raising awareness of its ramifications and for advancing scientific study, inquiry on its causes and its characteristics. Now, by playing a convening role in the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention, we are assisting teams of community stakeholders and leaders in selected cities across the country, including Boston, in implementing comprehensive research-based violence prevention and reduction plans. But there are several several additional steps that I feel we have to take. First of all, we need to recognize that children's exposure to violence is a public health issue and it demands a public health response. From my colleagues and my partners in the field and from my wife who works as a physician, I've learned a great deal about the advantages of adopting a, a public health approach when addressing problems including criminal justice problems. Now, this means calling attention not only to a problem's symptoms, but also to its source. It means focusing on prevention, asking which populations are most vulnerable, and determining how behavior spreads. Second, we must address the problem holistically, not just in fragments. We need the type of success that's been achieved at the Boston Medical Center, where pediatric providers have come together with mental health professionals and with attorneys to ensure that all of a child's interests are protected. At the Justice Department, offices covering a broad range of issues from violence against women and juvenile justice to community-based policing and victims of crime are actively engaged in coordinating efforts in preventing uh, children's exposure to violence. We are building on existing partnerships with the Departments of Education and Health and Human Services, as well as with our law enforcement partners in the field, uh, with the U.S. Attorney's offices across the country. And we are now teaming up with organizations such as the American Psychological Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the National Council on Juvenile and Family Court Judges to broaden our perspective and implement the comprehensive solutions that we clearly need. We also have embraced the reality that while the federal government has a responsibility to act, our efforts cannot be successful without local police officers, without local community leaders, teachers, coaches, principals, and above all, parents. Third, we must ensure that professionals within each discipline are sufficiently trained to identify children who've been exposed to violence and to assist with remediation. These signs, as you know, may be as obvious as a physical injury or as subtle as a mild cognitive impairment. Now, of course, neither is a definitive sign of exposure, but a process for screening can be effective in determining what may be wrong and how best to treat it. Fourth and finally, we must meet this problem with all the resources that sound science can bring to bear. I really want to emphasize the notion of sound science. Restoring scientific decision-making at the Justice Department is one of my highest priorities. And while research has told us much about the incidents and the impact of violence, it hasn't yet told us everything that we need to know. We need more information about what works and what does not, so that policymakers and 
practitioners can make informed decisions about how to tackle a problem and how to tailor their approaches to the needs of individual communities. That's one of the reasons that the work underway here in Boston is so exciting. Earlier today, I met with uh, your local youth violence prevention team, a diverse and dedicated group, and I have no doubt that their work will make a powerful difference for communities and young people across Massachusetts and, and far beyond. And here, before another group of partners, I am reminded of something that the school's former dean, Harvey Feinberg, once said, and I quote, if a medical school is akin to a school of law, then a school of public health is like a school of justice. Since the turn of the last century, the Harvard School of Public Health community has confronted every great public health crisis of our time with the same urgency and with the same sense of mission that has always inspired our nation's pursuit of justice. Over the years, you've made critical contributions to the field, to our communities, and to our entire country. Through the Youth Violence Prevention Center, the Boston Data Project, and other initiatives, you've done the same for children's exposure to violence. By your very presence here today, you've, been, you've demonstrated your commitment to solving a problem that, simply put, will determine the future course of this nation. I share your commitment, and I believe that together we can transform America for the better, one child at a time. So on behalf of the Department of Justice, I look forward to working with all of you and to continuing the critical discussion that we are beginning here today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. You and I both grew up in Queens. Yes, indeed. We both rooted for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yes, indeed. Uh, but we didn't cross paths till around uh, 1985 or so. Uh, when I was home uh, flipping TV channels one evening, and I landed on C-SPAN, and you were giving a speech uh, as a um, U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia on violence prevention, on youth violence in general. And you stressed in your remarks the importance of prevention and of identifying causes. And I said, bingo, I'm going to write to that man. And you uh, uh, res responded to that letter almost immediately. And we, we, uh, my colleague Susan Moses and I met with you, and we um, um, decided, agreed to partner. Mm -hmm. And that led to um, a series of youth violence prevention leadership forums in which we had a group of young people from the District of Columbia on stage sharing the reality of their own lives. Uh, and then after that discussion, we went to a policy panel to examine what could we do on the, to address the concerns that the young people mm -hmm. had raised. And there were two, I don't know whether you're aware of this, there were two important outcomes of those events. Um, the audience for those events were local decision makers, policy makers, corporate executives. One was in the audience was Andrew Plepler, who after listening to the kids on the panel, he offered summer jobs to several of them. And that eventually grew to become the Urban Alliance Foundation, yeah. which has offered job training and mentoring to over 10,000 uh, young people from the inner city in Washington, D.C. And I know you've addressed mm -hmm. that a group of young people uh, at that program. Uh, and the second outcome was the creation by the Harvard School of Public Health of a national media campaign to help fuel the growth of the mentoring movement in collaboration with many of the leading mentoring programs, such as Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and the National Mentoring Partnership. And when we started that 14, 15 years ago, um, some 300,000 young people each year were receiving the benefits of a, an organized, formal mentoring program. And together, we've been able to grow that to in excess of 3 million mm -hmm. today. So what that says to me, and finally my question, uh, but this is <laughs> supposed to be a conversation, so it's more than just a question. It was good stuff, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got this cadre of yeah. three million volunteers who are working one-on-one -on -one with young people. Are there ways that we could mobilize that cadre of volunteers to help us identify and, and get help for young people who are in trouble as a result of exposure to violence? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a, a wellspring in this country of people who want to be involved uh, in, the, in positive outcomes and who understand the need for 
um, young people to have interaction with positive adult role models. And I, you know, people are busy. People have you know, very full um, lives. But I think when called upon and when they see the, the possibilities, the consequences, the positive consequences that come from um, interacting with young people and mentoring relationships, um, I think people tend to want to get involved. And I think the hardest thing is to get them over to that, that get them to in the door the first time. Because once you're in the door, you're hooked. Um, you know, it's not uh, a racial thing. Uh, when I was the U.S. Attorney in Washington, D.C., we adopted a school in a, a low-income, uh, predominantly African-American community in Washington, D.C., and took a bunch of uh, people from the U.S. Attorney's Office down there on a pretty consistent basis. Most of the people in the U.S. Attorney's Office were white, and well, there was some hesitance on our part. What, how are the kids going to react to that? These kids don't see color. Mm -hmm. They see um, adults willing to help them answer questions um, for them, um, the boys, you know, roughhousing with, the, with the, the guys in the office. I mean, doing all the kinds of things that you want a good mentor to do. They look for, for direction. And so um, my thought always is that uh, we need to encourage mentorship as much as we can. The Justice Department, we have, uh, I think, invested hundreds of millions of dollars over the last uh, 15 years. The First Lady has tried to, uh, on a national level, encourage uh, mentoring. And I think it is something that uh, is extremely worthwhile and it's proven to be effective. As I understand, the White House actually has uh, initiated their own mentoring program for kids from D.C. who mm -hmm. come into the White House every other week to meet on a regular basis with a, with a staffer, which I think is mm -hmm. tremendous. And you and I most recently crossed paths at an event that the Harvard School of Public Health co-sponsored mm -hmm. at the Library of Congress during National Mentoring Month uh, with the First Lady and the Secretary of Education and HHS as well as yourself. And you told the story of an important mentor from your own life. Yep. And I'd love for you to repeat it for this audience. Sure. Dr. Hedley Scott. Um, uh, in, in the neighborhood where I grew up, everybody, you know, there was uh, doctors. Well, not, we didn't have doctors. We had a doctor. Um, <laughs> there was one doctor. And there was a lawyer, but he was not quite in the neighborhood. Um, but a lot of folks uh, with lower middle income jobs, janitors, um, a couple of people were doing things that probably were a little on the other side of the other law, but you know, they were still good people. Um, and Dr. Scott was a person who uh, took an interest in me. Uh, my father, who I loved dearly and uh, who was a, a guiding force in my life, didn't finish high school. Uh, my mother did finish high school, but no one in my uh, family, either immediate family or extended, had ever gone to college. Dr. Scott uh, was a, a radiologist and took an interest in me. And, um, would come over periodically as he was having a drink with my father, watching a ball game or something, but always took a little time to uh, encourage me and say, you know, how are you doing your studies? Um, you know, you can be a lawyer if that's what you want to be. And every, just to drop a little something every now and again. And um, he was, it wasn't something that for me was very conscious at the time. I wasn't very conscious of what he was doing. Um, but as I got older, and uh, I was at Columbia, and he would uh, come over, and then I was kind of on the back porch with them having a drink. At the, the drinking age at that point was 18. <laughs> uh, having a drink with him and my father, uh, I, I kind of understood, you know, what he was uh, doing in a very conscious way. I thought it might, and he said, no, I, I saw that you had, you know, the potential, and uh, you needed a bit of a push. And, um, you know, there wasn't, you were not surrounded necessarily by people who understood um, all that you had to do in order to, to get to college. So I thought that, you know, I'd help. And I, you know, for the life of me, I will uh, always uh, remember that and always treasure that interaction. And that story also shows how little time it ha has to take. It doesn't have to take a tremendous amount of time no. to make a difference. He just has to be conscious and aware of the difference that he can make and to be consistent, because mm -hmm. it wasn't just once he asked that, no. but repeatedly over time. I think that really is kind of the key, yeah. the, this notion of consistency. Didn't, mm -hmm. I think you're right, didn't take huge amounts of time, yeah. but he was there, you know, yeah. every week, or every couple of times a week, and always with a little something that you, you kind of, hmm, a little something to make you think about, yeah. uh, you know, the, the possibilities. So I have another question without a long preface, uh, but it has a short preface, and that, uh, I'm delighted you're here today and amazed that you could be here today. What I uh, mean by that, given the issues that are on the plate of the U.S. Attorney General and your department as a whole, this is a question really about leadership and management. And that how do you organize your day, organize your week and your month, your calendar, your staff, and the entire department 
so as to find and protect the time for the, what I call these silent crises that don't make headlines and don't generate congressional hearings, but have a profound influence on people across the country. How do you, how do you get yourself here today to talk about, at a couple of events in Boston, uh, y the issue of uh, young people uh, um, uh, exposed to violence? How do you make that happen as a leader and as a manager? Well, you know, what I've tried to do, we've identified what we're going to be doing in, in the near future at the Justice Department over the next couple of years. And we've come up with this notion that we're going to focus on protecting the American people. And it's got four components, um, protect the American people in the national security sphere, um, protect the American people from financial fraud, from, um, from violence, and then also protecting our most vulnerable communities. And so from my perspective, you know, what we're doing here today is just as important as um, what we did on Sunday in connection with um, you know, Osama bin Laden. Um, we have to protect the American people in the national security sphere. I understand that. But we also have a responsibility at the Justice Department to do something that I think we are uniquely capable of doing, and which is to change the way in which we deal with the problem of youth violence, how that is dealt with in our criminal justice system, um, how we prevent it from happening, you know, this whole notion of a, uh, a public health perspective. I mean, it's not a coincidence that we see the greatest amounts of violence where we see the greatest amount of social dysfunction. And I think um, if you want to be, in, from my perspective, a good prosecutor, um, a good criminal justice um, participant, you've got to deal with those underlying causes. And from my view, what we do here and what we do in this sphere is just as important as um, what we do when it comes to Wall Street crime, when it comes to um, other forms of violence, when it comes to the national security threat that we are, are constantly facing. Um, it's a responsibility that we have. It's an opportunity that I have given the limited time I will be at the Justice Department. Um, but I th also think there's a moral component to it. Um, we're talking about the future of this nation and what we want this country to look like. And if this nation is to live up to its founding principles, I think you have to start with the, uh, the work that we're doing uh, in this area. I guess the question I still have is how does that translate at the management level? The, the, the late um, Dr. Julius Richmond, the esteemed Harvard Medical School professor and former U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, used to talk about the phenomenon of the urgent driving out the important. So given your philosophical and strategic approach at a tactical level on a daily, weekly basis, who is it who's the guardian of those parts of your calendar for you so that all actually happens? Well, I first say that this is both, this area is both urgent and important. Um, but I also have people, um, the head of the Office of Justice Programs, Lori Robinson, the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Office of Justice Programs, uh, Mary Lou Leary, um, are people who are, we meet, I guess, every other week or so, and they're constantly telling me other things that, I mean, they're, you, you can tend to get pulled in other directions. Um, when some big national security event happens. Um, I probably would not have been able to focus on this as much as I wanted to like last Sunday, um, for instance. Um, but they are constantly um, monitoring things and coming up with ideas, ways in which we can engage um, communities at risk, um, children who are facing um, issues, and, and, and keeping us on task, keeping me on task. Again, I've identified these four areas that are what this Department of Justice is going to be about and what I think our legacy will be built on, and this is one of them. Thank you. One more question before we go to q and A. I'm being asked to move the program along. But <clears throat> as I was kind of dive, digging into the issue this past week of, of uh, children exposed to violence, because it's not an area in which I have any expertise, became apparent pretty soon that it's a highly complex problem, like unbelievably complex and multifaceted. And whenever I've been faced with a problem that's highly complex, I always tend to ask myself, how do you take that highly complex problem, break it into separate manageable components, and then look for one component where there's a meaningful opportunity for progress at the time? And so on drunk driving prevention, that's what led to the designated driver campaign, a very narrow focus. It wasn't about law enforcement. It was only about changing social norms. And we wanted to use that simple message to, to, as a wedge to generate both visibility and momentum that could pay off on a broader variety of fronts. And so I've been thinking about, for this set of issues, what could be the counterpart to designated driver, in a sense? And 
To me, it's the issue of bullying. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that's so is that's a much more public act. It's in a social setting very often. There are, it's, it's surrounded by enablers, and you could think in terms of, of changing the social norms and expectations within the school environment so that it's an expectation that others will intervene, mm -hmm. their peers, and put a stop to bullying. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to ask what your thoughts are. I know the White House recently had a summit on bullying and uh, what the, your and the administration's thoughts are about a strategy for approaching this. You know, it's an interesting thing. I, I, bullying is clearly something that we have not looked at as a nation, I think, adequately in the past in a very personal way. Um, I have a 17-year-old daughter and who uh, I was discussing this with her and she told me that she was bullied when she was in the fifth and sixth grade and had never revealed this to me before. And uh, it brought tears to my eyes to hear her describe what she had uh, experienced. It wasn't physical, um, but she was made fun of. She was the only black kid in her class and they talked about the texture of her hair and um, some, physical some physical characteristics. And and I said, well, honey, why didn't you tell me about this? And she said, well, you know, because I, I thought I could, I could deal with it. But it's clearly had an impact on her. And so I think that, um, you know, and we live in a great neighborhood. She's got, you know, two you know, wonderful parents. And you would think that her life in a whole bunch of ways would be um, ideal. And yet this little black girl had to deal with, uh, with that. And so I think you're right. There are ways in which we have to try to break this down. But I think there are also things we have to try to identify that will engage the American people so that, um, as I said before, we get them in the door and understand that this is a place where uh, you can have an impact on the children of this country. You can have an impact on the, uh, the fate of this nation. Uh, and at the same time, you can feel good about the time that you will devote to this effort. Thank you. Before taking the first question, I wanted to ask a question of a member of our audience, child psychiatrist, Dr. Alvin Poussaint. And um, Al, my, my question is, in terms of the research that's been done so far, is there enough of a knowledge base to justify the creation of a checklist of signs and symptoms to help people in the educational system, in the health system, in the criminal justice system to identify those young people who have been exposed to violence and are showing important negative consequences? Yeah. That's a good question. But before I answer it, though, I just want to say. You know, for the cameras, I bet they wish you would stand up. They wish I could stand <laughs> up. Uh, anyway, I, I would just like to point out the contradictions in our society in the messages that we send to children about violence and its legitimacy. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the United States, uh, we can still paddle children in the schools. There's 20 states that still allow teachers and principals to paddle children. Now, when we have violence prevention programs in the schools and the school system itself can paddle kids, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And it also is a message to parents that corporal punishment is OK. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the underlying causes of a lot of violence in the community, in families, uh, among children, is the use of physical punishment because a lot of that physical punishment turns into certifiable child abuse. And about two-thirds of child abuse cases, in fact, start off with a parent disciplining their child with physical punishment. So I would just say that we, our children are confused because violence is OK in a lot of situations, mm -hmm. and then we don't want them to use it. The other thing, getting back to your questions, I think that physical punishment and domestic violence and observing violence uh, produces a lot of anger in children. And it's that anger, in fact, is at the bottom of a lot of their striking out and using violence toward, toward other people. One of the things that I think we'd neglect is, that, is dealing with that anger. See, what do we, as a psychiatrist, I know that we don't focus on anger in, in a way. If a kid is anxious or depressed, you know, that's clinical. Mm -hmm. you know, hot stuff. But when anger is present, we don't think of referring that child for help, to get help, but I think anger in itself should probably be in DSM-4 or something mm -hmm. as, a, as a syndrome. And I think th we have to ask ourselves, where does that anger come from at such early ages in children? Physical punishment, the way they're treated, psychological abuse is one of the, the, the issues. 
And I think the whole is, is complicated, but I think we have to focus in on that, that anger. Because I've seen children, particularly when I used to work at uh, Judge Baker, where the issue was not like conflict resolution mm -hmm. in getting them to change. Beca because they were so angry, they were the type of kids who were looking for targets of the anger. The type of children you meet in the hallway, the other kids, and they say, I don't even look at him. Because if you look at him, he's going to say, who the hell are you looking at? And walk over and bop you in the jaw. See, what, what, what is that all about? And is it a, should we alert teachers? That's a warning sign to me. Mm -hmm. Because I think underlying a lot of violence is rage. But then again, the children see it in the media over and over again. It's glamorized, right? And then it, it hits our most vulnerable youth, you know, who who in fact, because of that, that glamorization and the, and the indirect like status you get from using, using violence can propel them very easily to hurt, uh, hurt other people. So I think we also have to know not in bullying, not just about the victim, but why does a bully become a bully? Mm -hmm. See, what's underlying bullying? It's a lot of anger, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Disdain, wanting to hurt people at a very early ages. And, uh, and of course, that brings us it's to the- It's about anger or wanting control? Well, it's, 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 probably, it's, probably, it's probably both. Mm -hmm. But I think it serves mostly as a release of anger mm -hmm. by hurting someone else, not just, you know, not just uh, control as I think of it. And even thinking about my own childhood, the bullies wanted to beat you up, it wasn't about controlling. <laughs> They were usually angry kids who were looking for trouble and you knew you had to walk in a different direction if they were around. So all of those issues, and then it takes us back to the family. But I just, leaving this paddling in the schools, there's about over 103 countries that have outlawed paddling of children in schools in the world. 103. Mm -hmm. One of them is not the United, the United States. And then there's 23 countries or so who've outlawed corporal punishment in the family. I say outlawed, you, you can you know, dress that up in a different way. But we, in fact, accept physical punishment in many quarters, it's very legitimate uh, in America. And in some communities, it's used more than in other communities. And that's reflected, uh, maybe not cause an, of a, an effect, in the rates of violence uh, in those families and communities. Thank you. Yeah. Felton, Earls, anything to add that you would want to add to that? You didn't know I was going to call in. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Um, I don't have anything to add to bullying, but uh, I should say that our research in Chicago, the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods, did reveal two findings which I think are very important to the discussion we're having today. The first is that, uh, you know, we discovered that collective efficacy, social capital in neighborhoods, reduced levels of, of violence. Um, but uh, that civic engagement that generates collective efficacy is at its lowest point between the ages of 15 and 19, exactly the point at which children are the most likely to be involved in crime. So one of the conundrums of that research is that how do you, how do you engage children in true, legitimate civic activity at an age when they're disrespected, when they're thought to be irresponsible, uh, et cetera? The second thing we found is that it's much more difficult to generate high collective, high collective efficacy for boys than it is for girls. That girls seem to prosper in good family supervision and in good neighborhoods. Uh, however, boys, perhaps because they're more exposed to risk in neighborhoods, I'm not sure, that uh, without having a strong neighborhood, it doesn't matter how engaged the parents are, how effective the parents are if they're living in a bad neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So again, it focuses this checklist, mm -hmm. has to include neighborhood factors mm -hmm. as well as family factors as well as individual factors. Thank you. So now we're going to open the floor to any questions that our studio audience has and then our online audience. We want to focus the questions in on the particular subject matter of today's forum uh, with that as a preface. Who's got the first question? Yeah. Hello, uh, and uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for focusing on this. It's, uh, as you said, it is the future of uh, our nation. Um, and just to uh, 
comment a little on what Dr. Prasant was saying, uh, it really highlights how important it is that we intervene early, is that when we know that when young children are um, abused, uh, when they are neglected, that there are actual physiological changes that are occurring in their brains uh, that have devastating effects on how they're going to behave socially uh, as they get older, and that intervening when people are older is, is far, far harder. Uh, one area, when we look at child abuse prevention, that is, uh, has been horribly neglected uh, is the issue of disputed child custody uh, in the, the family courts. Uh, something that people have known for a long time is that uh, men who are abusive uh, to their wives uh, are much more likely to be abusive to their kids, both physically and sexually. And the main reason that a woman with kids leaves that abusive man is because she's worried about the effects on the kids. However, when she goes to the institution that is supposed to help protect her and her children from this abuse, supposed to really break that cycle, very often, far too often, uh, officials in the family court system actually end up uh, aiding that abuse by either giving some form of accessible custody to an abusive man, even though they understand he's abusive, there's, there ha that evidence has been uh, presented, or actually taking custody away from the non-abusive parent um, based on many things, a lot of it um, ignorance, but also, frankly, lack of, of, of oversight. So here we have thousands and thousands and thousands of children every year at a critical point where they are certainly very high risk for going on and having all sorts of problems where you know, we could be doing so much better. Um, so I'd love to hear what uh, you feel the department no, I, can do. I think that what you say is true. Now, you have to understand something. I think I'm a pretty good lawyer, but a lot of the things that you all are talking about are well beyond my area of expertise. And so when you talk about physiological changes and things, these are things that um, I was exposed to um, in interacting with Jay, you know, way back when, when I was U.S. attorney. I was kind of shocked to read these things. As I said, I interacted with experts in the field and was exposed to... Um, a, a body of knowledge that I, at first I almost kind of thought, like, how is this possible? You know, you, you didn't get bopped in the head. How could your brain be affected by what it is that you observe? But over the years, I've been, you know, educated and I understand it now. But I'm still not the experts, you know, an expert in the same way that you all are. Uh, when I was the U.S. Attorney in, in Washington, we started a domestic violence unit. Uh, one of the reasons being that the prosecutors who handled these kinds of cases needed to know about the unique circumstances, unique fact situations, um, the sensitivities that they needed to have when dealing with um, those kinds of cases. And um, I was a judge in Washington, and I would talk to uh, my fellow judges who were involved in domestic violence cases, and that what you said is very often true. And so I think you know the courts, the judges, had to be sensitized, educated about, uh, about these issues. And it was interesting to see that women would sometimes not report domestic instances of domestic violence out of fear of losing their children. Which, uh, you know, when I heard that from advocates, I said, that, that can't possibly be true. And then they would come up with evidence that would show that, in fact, that was the case. And I think that was, a, again, it showed, up, showed the need for us prosecutors to be sensitive, but also, I think, indicated to me um, the need to educate uh, judges who were handling these cases. Mary Lou Leary was in the U.S. Attorney's Office with me at that point, and there was some resistance, you, know, you remember, within our office with prosecutors who didn't necessarily, A, want the creation of a unit, um, and then didn't want to necessarily go through the, the, the training. Um, we, only, we only took volunteers to go in, into that unit, and uh, I think now it is something that is accepted within the office, but at the time was, a, was very novel. So mine is more of a, a practical question, given that much of uh, uh, juvenile justice both on the delinquency side and abuse and neglect, is done at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, and given that the frustration is that we tend to know what programs work and what don't work, um, what is the Department of Justice's thinking about uh, incentivizing states to 
look at the science that you were talking about and actually uh, incentivize them to try some of these programs that we see working in various pockets of the country. So creation of political will to, right. to do it. Uh, right. What's the Justice Department's thinking on that? Oh, I'm Ronald Sullivan, a professor at the uh, Harvard Law School uh, and former PDS uh, director uh, after your, your time in D.C. <laughs> it's the best public defender's office in the country. Um, used to beat my office all the time. Um, not all the time. <laughs> um, the, well, I don't remember the question now. Incentivize. Oh, states. yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that we do is uh, through the grant making that we have at the Office of Justice Programs is that we make grants available um, to, uh, we, we put out uh, projects that we want to get involved in and ask cities to bid to become involved. You'd be surprised the number of cities that want to try these things, the number of neighborhoods that want to try these things, and the amounts of money that we give are not necessarily overly large. Um, but when we've, uh, we put out these uh, projects that we want to begin, we get you know, hundreds, literally hundreds of communities who want to participate. And then I think if you find, um, you get a mayor who's particularly interested and who wants to buy into the notion of having an integrated approach, knocking down silos. Uh, we're talking to uh, Mayor Menino today and what Boston is trying to do around this issue. Very, very impressive. Um, it, it almost feeds on itself. You know, you, again, you get them in the door and um, you have them see that there is a way in which um, you can have an impact which ultimately makes the mayor, the political leaders, you know, more successful, obviously has a, has a benefit to the community. And the amounts of money that we will give to them to get them started and then to support it are relatively, relatively small. Um, as I said, I think it's somehow or other, it's, it's getting communities, individuals in the door. And once you do that, I think, uh, think you're fine. So I think there's a cachet, I think, also that goes with saying that you're involved in something being sponsored by the United States Department of Justice or you know, the, federal, the federal government. And we try to use that cachet in addition to the money that, uh, that we can spread around to try to get people involved and communities involved. Question at the back, yeah. Uh, Tom Minus, orthopedic surgeon here at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, it was a great uh, discussion so far. I'm enjoying this. Uh, having young kids myself, um, my concern is your statement on the observation of violence and its profound effect on the psyche and the physical well-being in the short term and long term of children. So having said that, um, here we are watching television, um, playing video games. Uh, I went and saw my son's video game the other day. I didn't even realize it was uh, his. And I was struck by the amount of violence that was going on in these games and all the other young boys who were there also were engaged in this. And in the young developing mind, uh, how are they to uh, separate fiction from uh, fact? Mm -hmm. And is it just observational violence of real violence, or is uh, media also an observation of violence that can affect them? Well, this one is one I have to, I think, leave in some ways to the experts. I, mean, I can certainly say that when it comes to the observation of the real or experiencing the real, um, I think that has an impact. And I don't think there's any question about that. But I've seen, and again, I'm just reading these things, that there, there are two schools of thought about um, how children react to video games or cartoons, you know, things of that nature. Um, maybe a little more of a consistent uh, stream of uh, opinion when it comes to observing real people um, in movies uh, as opposed to, you know, cartoon characters or video um, characters. Um, I don't know, but I think it's something that we need to be, you know, cognizant of and aware of. And uh, it seems to me that there is at least the potential there to have an impact, or we ought to be concerned about the potential impact. Uh, when I was in private practice, I represented the group that um, grades um, video games. And they do a real serious job about trying to look at these games. I mean, they have these young people come in and, you know, it's. Uh, something you watch video games for like hours on end and then put you know the E's the T's and the M's on the uh, on the games and I think that's something that um, it makes sense that again I don't know this is something I feel more than I'm able to say that uh, I have any kind of statistical evidence but I think we need to be sensitive to that and expose um, younger people uh, to less violent things Older kids can, I think, maybe the brain matures, maybe they can handle it a little better. 
but again, I, I'm getting a little out of my lane here when it comes to when it comes up. But I do think that we need to be careful in that regard. Uh, Robin Herman has a question from an online viewer. Right. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Robin Herman. I'm director of the forum, and we have people who are watching online and sending in questions. And we have a question uh, today from uh, Meg Garvin, who is executive director of the National Crime Victim Law Institute at Lewis and Clark Law School. And she asks, um, in light of three facts, uh, she has three bulleted facts, <laughs> um, that the job of the Department of Justice prosecutors is not solely about children, and that children are often victims of crimes, and therefore witnesses in cases, and that children have rights in criminal cases that can protect them from re-victimization that can occur in criminal cases because the system's not designed to help children. She asked, doesn't it make sense to ensure all children who are victims and witnesses have independent attorneys protecting them, as the um, ABA has recommended? Well, you know, I, I think that you can go, I think children certainly need to be protected in, in the system. And uh, one of the things that we try to do, I keep going back to the U.S. Attorney's Office, is to come up with a, we had a victim uh, witness assistance uh, unit, and it helped all uh, people who had to come in as victims or as witnesses, but we came up with unique ways in which we tried to help children who became a part of the system, either as witnesses or um, as victims. They have unique needs. Um, we, I mean, we had a room that had all kinds of things that you know, kids would be able to use, um, use to explain what it is that they saw. Um, you know, whether every child needs to have a lawyer as opposed to, frankly, somebody who has a more therapeutic background and who can deal with the issues that um, a kid's going to have to deal with in recounting something that he or she has seen or that they have experienced. Um, you know, I, I, there might be legal rights that need to be protected, but I think judges have the ability um, to uh, appoint um, you know, guardians ad litem or to help in, in, in that regard. Um, I'm actually a little more concerned about um, as I said, the, the therapeutic needs and, and having therapists being more a part of the, the criminal justice system and protecting the needs of kids in that way. Uh, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. The business of medicine is an individual transaction between a provider and an individual patient. We believe every patient is unique. In many respects, it seems to me the justice system is the same. We deal with individuals. What we strive for in public health is to deal with populations, particularly when in this world there are lots of people that don't have access to the medical, therapeutic, or legal expertise that they need. And the question I'm asking is, is the Justice Department thinking about ways to engage, let's say, the social networks that determine population behavior, not just the um, targeting to individual kids with individual problems? Well, I mean, I think what we are trying to do, um, because it's most efficient, um, and I think probably in the end most effective, is to really look at large populations, to look at neighborhoods, to look at states, um, to look at regions as we um, deal with these issues. Um, even though I think it's safe to say that, you know, every demographic group, every community is dealing with the, these kinds of issues, uh, what we try to do is to engage uh, as many people as we can, as many governmental structures uh, as we can, um, social networks as you, as you described them. Um, you know, we're always looking, you know, we can't focus as much as we might want on individual children. I mean, we hope that ultimately an individual child will benefit from, from our efforts, or individual children will benefit from our, our efforts. But I think the programs that we have designed really do try to engage um, communities. And um, one of the I guess, programs we're doing now, the uh, Defending Childhood Initiative, we are engaging, I guess, six or eight communities that we have, um, where we think they have come up with really good approaches. and. Um, so I think that is the way in which we deal with uh, this notion of, of social networks as opposed to, to individuals. But always with the thought that we're going to have an impact on kids, a kid, you know, a group of kids. Um, Barbara Ferrer, you had a question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm Barbara Ferrer. I'm the health director for the city of Boston, and I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Attorney General for being here with us today. I also want to thank him for his leadership. Um, certainly as a public health director, it's refreshing to have uh, the Attorney General talk about public health and a public health approach when you're thinking about violence. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you've uh, accomplished so far in the Defending Childhood Initiative where you've actually 
uh, brought together at the federal level other agencies, the Education Department, the Health and Human Services Department, and how you have modeled at the federal level your expectations for uh, the ability at local levels for us to actually get to the root causes. Because I think, you know, uh, it's in that root cause conversation that we need those partnerships. And I, I think you've been a brilliant leader on this, and I wondered if you could just share some of the lessons you've learned and the approaches you've taken. I think one of the things we've certainly learned on the federal level, and certainly one of the things we talked about earlier in our meeting um, with a very impressive program that you all are putting together here in Boston, is this notion, I think as you all have described it, of breaking down silos. Um, that the Justice Department can't do this alone. Uh, Department of HHS, um, Labor, Education, um, there are a whole variety of places that need to be uh, a part of this effort. You know, it, in, I was, in some ways, as I was saying earlier in the meeting with you, that some of our best crime fighters are teachers. You know, um, if you, uh, when I was a judge in Washington, D.C., the number of uh, people who I put in jail who had completed high school over the course of my five years as a judge was minimal. I mean, I, I literally think I can count them on the fingers of, of two hands. And um, so this notion that um, dealing with the criminal justice system, protecting people, protecting kids is something only for the Justice Department to do. Uh, the criminal justice system, so I think that's wrong. Um, we have to have partners break down these, these barriers, these silos. And what we have tried to do on the federal level is to break those um, barriers down so that we communicate with one another, so that we engage with one another, so that we're more efficient in the use of the resources that we have. And that's what we encourage in the programs that we've put together as we deal with, um, with local communities. And as I said, which I think Boston is doing a very good job of, when you looked at the meeting that we had today and who was around that table, you know, the superintendent, of schools, we had Pete, you were there, the mayor was there, um, the representative from the U.S. Attorney's Office, people from law enforcement, all people uh, who represent different groups who you might not traditionally think would be together um, dealing with these issues, but we think have to be a part of the uh, solution. I'm Dr. Poussant from the Harvard Medical School. I know you're very much involved in mentoring. Is anyone doing research yes. looking at mentoring to see what the impact it has on young people engaging in violence? Um, yes, actually there was a, a, by now, kind of classic landmark study conducted by public-private ventures in Philadelphia. It was actually a randomized trial. They took a thousand kids from the wait list of Big Brothers Big Sisters, ran, urban kids age 11 to 15, uh, randomly chose 500 of them and assigned them each a one-on-one -on -one mentor put the other 500 back on the wait list for the 18 months they would have normally been on it anyway. And then they took a look. And compared to the control group, the kids who had been matched with a mentor had a 47% lower rate of initiation of drug use, 22% lower rate of initiation of alcohol use, much better school attendance, much lower involvement in fighting within the school. And so what mentoring seemed to be doing is addressing all these categorical problems simultaneously by helping to meet the emotional needs of the child as a whole. And that study came out right about the same time as we had these policy forums where we heard from young people is what they need, they said, is someone in their corner who they could count on outside their family. Uh, who, and they didn't use the term, but it was a mentor, and it was just at the same time that the research was published and the two came together and we said, bingo, we're going to pursue this. Thank you all for coming. Mr. Attorney General, we are so grateful to you for being here today. Uh, I know everyone in the room and within the school, because I've had lots of discussions, has tremendous admiration for the job that you've done as Attorney General and throughout your entire professional career. It's a pleasure to know you, and it's a pleasure to call you a friend. Thank right. you. It's good to Please. see you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you.